Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Will the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Solti? Here. Councillor Savage? Here. Youth Representative? Here. Councillor Fleck? Here. Councillor Stennett? Here. Councillor Urban? Here. Councillor Roberts? Here. Mayor Galley? Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, there's no items to be added to the agenda. Brings us to appearances of interested citizens for items not on the agenda. This is a time for citizens to comment on items not listed on the agenda for a maximum of 30 minutes. Individual speakers must be recognized by presiding officer, provide their name and address, and will be allowed up to five minutes or less with council approval. Comments regarding any matter scheduled for public hearing may be provided only in that hearing. Comments on agenda items may be taken prior to council discussion on that item. Council will not engage in any discussion or make any decision based on public comments at this time. However, council may take the comments under advisement for discussion and action at a further council meeting. The first one I have is Ed Edward Renfo. Yes, sir. My name is Edward Renfo. Um, I have kids that go to school here in town. They go over there here on the down nice and low. Um, one, I want to remind folks, you folks went ahead and passed on helping with the clinic that's supposed to go in at the Lane Community College. You folks might take that into the center of that if a child gets the wrong kind of medication and ends up with an allergic reaction or something, they could possibly come back after you folks. That's just the only thing I want to say there. Two, the, the gentleman that was attacked, and I'm going to say this, attacked by your officers here this last month, um, I know him personally. I know he's not the greatest kid in the world. But what I have on tape and what I have seen from your officers is uncalled for and should not be looked at lightly. He put his hands behind his head. His hands were put behind his back and then he was slammed to the ground and punched multiple times, knocking two of his teeth out, causing a head injury and multiple stitches. Now, for you that don't know, I'm running for Oregon House Representative District 2, so I do know the laws of the state of Oregon. What your officers did is blatant assault. And trust me, it's being looked at by more than just me. The tapes are being reviewed over and over and over again, zoomed in and everything else. I have made sure what I've watched, I've watched multiple times. I don't agree with what Alex Harrelson has done in the past. His behaviors in the past, I will tell you that personally. And I am his uncle, and I didn't care for what the kid did. But what I saw on tape that day, he put his hands behind his head, walked out to the street, they put his hands behind his back, and then slammed him to the ground and continued to punch him. Why haven't your officers been used been taught the use of tasers? Why haven't your officers been taught the use of mace? What happened that day should have never happened. And now it's out there on video where his mom, his sisters, his uncles, his grandparents, his aunts get to leave. We live it over and over and over again. I've never agreed with what my nephew's done in the past. But with what I saw on those tapes, and I have zoomed it in to watch what happened. Somebody says now they're saying he reached for a gun. How did he reach for a gun when an officer had both his hands behind his back? And he walked out to that street. And all the video evidence, all of it, from the time he put his jacket on and everything else, there was never a gun on that gentleman. Never. So that to be said is horse crow. And I'm trying to be nice tonight. Because when did Cottage Grove change so much that they're going to beat an innocent person? He tried to cooperate with them and he got what? Railroaded sideways thrown to the ground and beaten. What if that was your nephew or your nephew or your brother? I don't care. Yes, Alex has had problems in the past. That day, was he causing anybody any harm? 
did he not try to cooperate with those officers? Have any of you seen the videotape? Have you? Have you? We're not going to engage with you on this. No, they will be on not professional. If you're not going to engage with your public people, maybe you shouldn't be where you're, you're at. Johanna Z. lighter things to talk about. I'm so sorry. Z, 1386 Place. So I do want to uh, talk about the affordable housing that you guys just had your work session on. I appreciated Council Roberts, your comments uh, about that and the thoughtfulness of other one people speaking up and taking the time. I do want to clarify, Eric had said um, that no comments about this until after the draft is done. We are always allowed to comment, you know, off the agenda. So we don't want to have the same thing happen that we happened, you know, with the, the homeless side is that um, the plan is completely done and then people, you know, see it and then comment on it. So I think people need to be a part of the process and really hear it and comment as it goes uh, along. So I just want to share that affordable housing um, is not going to address the homeless issue at all. The homeless issue is not a housing issue. It is a fallacy and a long tried method to address the issue of people living on the street. So um, a lot of excuses that abound about why these methods um, have not worked, uh, but they don't. And so that's the, of course, the definition of insanity to expect that by creating the affordable housing, it's going to address the homeless issue. issue. That's a separate issue um, in and of itself. So just some questions on this, and I know you can't engage your three years of studies and then a couple of years of building. My question is how much have the consultations and presentations and paperwork and all that actually cost um, the city. We've seen various uh, projections about population and things that never really came to fruition. They're not really accurate. So these are just, this is a lot of administrative uh, stuff here that we spend time and money in, and we're actually blind to what is happening around us. Community Strong did, did bring forth some ideas about the low-income housing. Um, I don't know a lot about the contractors in that, but I do know uh, you know, a fair amount about eco-friendly housing, whether it's hempcrete or pod houses, or, you know, we have the opportunity to do something very unique, but we need to look in front of us. Oftentimes we're just looking at what, um, you know, we're being told to do by some outside organization and we're just kind of following that. So I'm a little concerned um, that, you know, we listen to these organizations like League of Oregon Cities or OHA or CDC or the corporate known media for direction and truth, and we ignore, again, what's right in front of us. We ignore our own personal experiences, our discernment, and our common sense. So I really question the leadership in this community. I feel like you're hanging on the coattails of your city manager waiting for your next move. Um, this is not meant to be disparaging as when you're permitted to behave in a certain way um, for so long, it just gets very familiar and hard to step outside that program, you know, that patterning. I'm just inviting you guys to really step up, look what's in front of you and say, hey, what's going on? Put all those other organizations and rules and all those administrative mandates aside and say, what's important to us here and get out and talk to people more. So I was surprised, but not surprised that this is coming up right now. I thought, well, maybe this is to distract us from the low barrier site, maybe to push this through before elections. I don't know, but this feels again that the public is just being informed on issues rather than being a part of the discussion. Um, we didn't get a real town hall. We know that the closest we're getting is the Beeper Show and maybe Community Strong's meetings where we can sit and share real ideas and solutions for our community. So I'm concerned also that when you put a large number of low income housing in a very small space, Together, you're putting people who are facing serious life challenges and they're very, very, you know, destitute situations, and it's not going to help to uplift them. We're separating them from the rest of the community instead of embracing those who need um, the support. So I'm not against housing. We obviously need housing. We obviously need to address what's going on in our community, but I do question how much time and energy is spent on these administrative studies and um, years of doing this again. And I invite you to kind of think outside the box. You know, we're all looking at environmental issues these days, and we have an opportunity um, to do that. So I think that, um, you know, we can set those other things aside and 
not be so fixated on what are we being told to do by these other organizations, but let's get together and look at what's happening in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Venice Mason. My name is Venice. Can you hear me with the mask on? Am I clear? Okay, great. Um, my name is Venice Mason, and I live in the old city hall building downtown Cottage Grove. I have provided two um, images to you. You all have them in front of you. One is of Mr. Harrelson's face after he had received what was an unconscionable beating in an out of control scene in front of multiple witnesses in the community. The other picture, and this picture has been used in the media frequently and was actually um, has been requested by the FBI, who I was interviewed by Friday before last in the book mine regarding this incident. So if we think that the uh, world isn't kind of looking at what we're doing here, we have definitely come to the attention of the federal authorities. Um, I didn't provide them with the originals because I'm retaining an attorney to help me deal with the impacts of having witnessed this beating. Officer Dunlap was completely out of control of that scene. He put elders at risk. He put community members at risk. He put himself at risk. Off-duty police officer had to come in and help him finish a start, a fight that he started that he could not finish at all. That scene was out of control. I draw your attention to the second picture, which has not been used in the media. This is a picture of what was left of Alex Harrison on the sidewalk when they were done beating him. The white spots are his teeth. No one has used it because it is too traumatizing. I'm diagnosed with PTSD. I'm in treatment for what I witnessed that day. What happened was unconscionable. Having him reviewed by an officer who is serving as our captain is insufficient. There's a conflict of interest with him doing the investigation. We need an independent review. People are asking a lot of questions about what happened that day. And what I witnessed was four police officers and one off-duty police officer repeatedly punching, hitting, and beating his head into the sidewalk in front of everybody on the street, on camera, in front of multiple witnesses. There was elders there, there were children walking by, there was all kinds of things that could have went a lot more wrong with that day, and we're all pretty lucky, actually. And just like the gentleman who's a relative of Alex Harrison, I do not condone his former behavior. I do not think that him swinging a sword around was easy, but what has happened in the last few weeks in this community is absolutely unconscionable. Since then, there has been continued harassment at the homeless camp. I've witnessed it, I've filmed it, you wanna see it, I have an archive of it. It's called being an informed citizen. It started with Rodney, Rodney King, and that's when we all saw what happens when people have unchecked authority without being held accountable by their communities. It is very simple to do these things. We need to have mental health crisis teams that are available in our community, the funding is available, and Cottage Grove has grown up enough to meet it. With the methamphetamine problem, the mental health problem, and violence happening in all of our communities, with poverty striking everybody, and with tensions high in this community, there is no reason not to utilize available funding to create mental health crisis services with urgency in our community. We need to have impartial review from an outside agency. Let's not let that agency be the FBI. Can we do something else except wait for the feds to come investigate our city? Can we have an open conversation in a town hall meeting about violence in our community? And there have been further arrests, further harassment by Officer Dunlap at the homeless camp. Jonathan Turner was cited and had to be taken to the hospital suicidal after an interaction that was completely unfair with um, Officer Dunlap. So it's my suggestion that someone get a rain in on him at some point. The tensions in our city are high. We are doing our best to address the needs of our homeless community. We're doing the best to address our needs for safety. I myself personally have experienced police brutality. I also have family who are police officers. And I've also been in situations where the police have saved my life. Everybody here is human. This isn't just about individuals. This is about inherently oppressive power systems and what happens when people are given authority without accountability. Any one of us has no idea what we would do in that situation. 
I'm grateful that nobody died. And I'm grateful that it was somebody who isn't capable of standing up for himself or else he all wouldn't even be here. Thank you for letting me speak. Barbara Shea. Hi, I'm Barbara Schaff, and this is my first time. And what I'm finding out is there's not going to be a discussion between people. It's just my thinking. Well, I want to know what's going on with this tent city and how long it's going to go on. I want people to ad address this thing in our beautiful little town that smack dab in the middle, 99 and Main. And it's growing. And it's growing. And I know that there has to be sanitation problems. I know that there's laws that they're breaking, that they're not going by. Move them out. Send them home. Send them on down the road. I don't care where they go. I just don't want them in my town. I'm sorry, but I pay big taxes. And I don't want them, I don't pay them for them to sit there and do the drugs and partying all night and sleep all day. That's not what my taxes go for. And I've paid a lot of money for a lot of years in taxes. And there are, there are rules to even owning your own property that you cannot do on your own property. Why are there rules for those people? Don't, don't, is there a thing that can say, you might you can stay here three days and then you're gone, but you know that all the state parks and and the lakes and stuff they can't be there because there's rules, there's laws, and one of them is rivers. They cannot be by. I know this one for a fact. You cannot pollute a river. You cannot be a certain amount of feet away from a river. For one thing, sanitation. What are they doing for sanitation there? And what are they doing with children and dogs? When I was younger, if you if you didn't have sanitation, they came and took your kids away from you and kicked you out. There, there's nothing wrong with that. There's supposed to be sanitation, and I don't know why it's okay now to not have bathrooms, not have running water, not having facilities. Other than all free. If it's free, then it's fine for them. But if it's, if it's something they have to be responsible for. And I had a brother that was in the same situation. And I'll tell you what it boils down to is they don't, they like that lifestyle. They don't want to change it. Put them in a little house, you're going to find out. They're not going to stay out there because they want to do their drinking and partying at night and sleeping in the day because they don't want any responsibilities. And I know that for a fact. It's been in my family. And I'm tired of and I'm tired of working all these years. And I get a pinchy little amount of money for my social security. And they get money for doing nothing and drugging and drinking and partying and whatever. Like it's not right. It's just there's got to be something done. And to put to allow it in the middle, the stack dab middle. A bar of little town is almost more than I can handle. Because every day I go by there and there's more at it. And some of those tents are as big as a small house or a trailer. But you know, they're not planning on staying a day or two. They're putting up their residence. And, and, and I don't want to pay for them. I don't, I don't want to pay my taxes to the city of Cottage Grove and pay for them. I don't want it. And I think there's a lot of people that feel the same way I do. We don't know what to do about it because you can't compensate with me. You tell me anything. You, I'm just standing here baffling because nobody can give me any advice or tell me anything. But I do know there's laws on sanitation and laws on different things on properties that I have to abide by. They are not abide by. Why? Why do they not abide, have to abide by them? Send them on down the road. We don't need them here. Thank you. Mary and Jim Hauser. Okay, I just want to say something about the, the guy that got beat up. I think uh, the cops were in a tough situation there. And uh, this guy, I've seen him a year ago, so he was sort of around. And I thought it was really bizarre that he was still out a year later doing the same thing. And um, he's schizophrenic, and you can look at that video all you want. 
some people say he was wrong. Others will say it wasn't wrong. But the, the thing is, um, when someone tenses up and they're schizophrenic, you can't see that on the video. So um, mm -hmm. I've watched your cops in action against uh, druggies in our neighborhood with uh, cocaine-induced paranoia, and they, they're really good. They sit there and they defuse the situation and take these guys and, you know, out, or usually they'll let them walk and not even arrest them. So I've seen them do really good work. So I don't want you to sit there and um, railroad your cops um, in order to, you know, basically ease or, you know, make yourself feel better you know, against people that are reacting to a video. So try and try and be objective on this. And the, the bottom line, the reason they're having to deal with these situations is because nobody's dealing with mental health issues in this town. You've got a recovery center downtown. They don't have the services. When people want to get recovery and they've got, you know, um, mental problems because of drugs, and then you've also got South Lane and mental health. There's no reason we should have problems with um, mental health in this town. With you've got South Lane mental health, there. it's obviously not working. And the other thing I want to say to you, to all you guys that have been voting in this homeless camp, this is why people are moving into a town. You, you guys are a little bit blind. They're they're lining up. It's a waiting period over there by the trailhead, and they're just sitting there waiting to get into um, the free housing. So low barrier shelter. They're going to be partying over there, and uh, I'm going to have to hold you guys accountable. Uh, you know, it's not you know it sounds good. You feel good. You feel good. You feel good. You know, there's only a couple people here that are actually actually you know behaving you know fiscally responsibly um, for our taxpayers. I feel sorry for the lady that talked. She's been here a whole lot. She's on Social Security, and she can't enjoy her parks. I mean, these are people that built this town. We built this town. And you let these people come in and destroy the atmosphere. And it's because of, of what you guys are doing. So I need you guys to sit there and, and think twice about what you're doing, because it's gonna, I'm going to get active, and I'm going to start you know, making sure the right people are voted for uh, in November. Thank you. Bruce Kelsch. Bruce Kelsch, uh, 78340 Holderman Road in Cottage Grove. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to address the uh, September 1st police incident with Alexander Harrelson. Uh, friends of mine were eyewitnesses to what happened, and they have shared with me what they saw. And like so many others, I watched the video, read the news articles, and watched local news reports. I, I was shocked and appalled by what I saw. Quite rightly, there is an investigation going on, and due process is certainly one of the fundamentals of our legal system. I trust the investigation will be comprehensive and thorough, and all parties can feel that justice was served. The police department's public statement says it will use this incident to review its tactics, policies, and training, and will strive to improve when necessary and possible. I appreciate that even challenging situations like this one can be an opportunity to learn and improve. I advocate and support the following, amongst other ideas that are being, going to be presented. Body cameras. I believe there's significant support in our community for officers to wear and use body cameras. They protect officers from false claims and provide an objective record of what has happened. Review the policy on use of force and provide training and de-escalation techniques. Work with the county to create a CAHOOTS hybrid or other model that fits our community. And I understand there are county funds available for that. And council members may find my last suggest suggestion surprising. Review police salaries and compensation. In a conversation I had with Chief Shepard last year, he shared the Cottage Grove Police Department regularly loses officers to Springfield, which pays more. Jim Collins, the author of the well-known book, Good to Great, says an organization's success begins with having the right people on the bus. And the city should ask itself how it can attract, train, and retain the right people. Another area of concern that was raised in this incident is the municipal court, which I understand is under the purvey of the city council. Alexander Harrelson was appointed an attorney who was paid by the city, if I'm correct. His attorney was not a Lane County public defender. And Alex's city paid attorney persuaded him to plead guilty. It strikes me that there could have been a motivation on the part of the attorney to close this case quickly with a guilty plea. And the question I have is how can justice be served when the attorney's employer, the city, could be a future defendant? So the optics on that are 
interesting and, and worth investigating, I think. I hope that out of this very unfortunate situation, some good and some reforms and some changes can result. Thank you. Thank you. Dana Meriday. Uh, Dana Mary Day, 205 Adams Avenue. Uh, currently, there are cur uh, Cottage Grove community members standing on the picket lines 24-7 without pay. They've been there for over two weeks. Um, these are our, our fellow citizens, and they are standing up to a corporation who's made record profits, $2.5 billion this year. They're paying uh, high dividends to their shareholders. Their CEO makes over $12 million. And all they're asking for is fair uh, health benefits and wages that at least match inflation levels. Um, I would like to urge the council to offer a letter of support. And if you can't, as a body, consider that as an individual council member, offer community the community of the warehouser employees who spend their money when they're earning it here in the community or a vibrant part of our community. Gone are the days when W.A. Woodard formed the, his lumber operations that he sold to warehouser. In his day, he paid the highest wages in town. He ensured that his workers had a decent place to live. He fought for health care, helping form the hospital because he knew that woodwork was a dangerous uh, occupation and you might not survive a trip from the woods all the way to Eugene. So he helped form the community hospital here in town. Once he sold it, uh, the corporation doesn't have that same commitment to the community. They're only focused on profits and they are uh, siphoning the labor from the community, the, the timber from the hills that surround it, and they are answerable to no one here. So if you can, I would urge the council or individually to offer support for our workers and uh, address that concern to the corporation. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Canino. So Allison, are you online? Hit star six. Hit star six if you're on a phone or something. Okay, we'll move on then. <clears throat> I'm going to read a uh, prepared statement. We appreciate the comments regarding a recent incident with the police department. We as a city council cannot take any action regarding this incident. It's administrative function of the city manager. The city manager has taken steps to ensure the incident is fully investigated. There are two separate investigations proceeding, and we will not judge or interfere in those investigations. Doing so could be subject to the city to significant costs and jeopardize the further actions of any necessary after the conclusion of the investigation. The city's investigation is being conducted by an experienced investigator from outside agency and is being overseen by the experienced experience interim chief who is also from an outside agency. The city is in full cooperation with the FBI in the investigation as well. There have been too many examples in this country over the last couple of years where media, elected officials, and others have jumped to conclusion without complete information those examples are resulted in costly litigation, overturned actions, and unnecessarily delays and damages to those involved. As an employee of a member of a labor union, I completely understand the need to make sure that all information is correct prior to taking any action. It brings us to item five, public hearings. There is no public hearing, so item six, consent agenda. Move approval. Second. We have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution and ordinance. Item 7A is second vote for ordinance number 3163, amending Title V. Ms. Likens. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, at the previous City Council meeting, the City Council held the first vote on ordinance number 3163, amending Title V, Business Licenses and Regulations, Chapter 5.32, Transient Room Tax. Effective October 1, which is a Saturday, the City of Eugene has opted to use the Oregon Department of Revenue uh, to collect the transient lodging taxes for them and will no longer contract with various agencies, including the City of Cottage Grove, uh, to provide those collection services. Ordinance number 3163 will align the city's existing room tax procedures with the administrative requirements of the Oregon Department of Revenue, allowing them uh, to collect the transient lodging taxes for the city once an intergovernmental agreement is made for the collection of those taxes. Uh, the agreement cannot be finalized until after the ordinance is adopted. The model intergovernmental agreement is attached and has been available for your review. Uh, the cost of the collection service is estimated to be approximately $197 per month, which is less than what the city could do it for ourselves. Um, the collection will happen in the months of April, July, October, and January of each year. Uh, previously, they were being collected and paid to the city on a monthly basis. So this may affect how um, the Chamber of Commerce receives their, their funding as one person of the taxes collected goes to them. It is important to note that the proposed amendments do not create a new tax or change the city's existing room tax rate applicable to the transient rentals within the city of Cottage Grove. Uh, the term transient room tax is being updated uh, to transient lodging tax as used in ORS 320. Uh, the term, or, excuse me, the ordinance repeals Title 5, Chapter 5.32 and replaces it in full attached to the ordinance's Exhibit A. It's the recommendation that the City Council hold the second vote on ordinance number 3163, amending Title V Business License and Regulations, Chapter 5.32, Transient Room Tax, and authorize the City Manager to enter into an intergovernmental agreement uh, with the State of Oregon Department of Revenue for collection of the transient lodging taxes beginning October 1, 2022. Any questions? Councilor Irvin. I would move that uh, ordinance number 3163, amending Title V, Business License and Regulations, Chapter 5.32, Transit Room Tax, and authorize the city manager to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Revenue for collection of transient lodging taxes beginning October 1st, 2022. Second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the recorder please call the roll? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. You representative? Aye. Councilor Fleck? Aye. Councilor Sennett? Aye. Councilor Irvin? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Mayor Galley? Aye. Thank you. So item or ordinance 3163 is adopted. Brings us to item B, second vote for ordinance number 3164, amending title 10 vehicles and traffic. Mr. Myers. At the, at the previous city council meeting, the council held the first vote on ordinance number 3164 that established regulations associated um, with camping inside a vehicle in, and um, or camping within the right of way um, within a community. Um, basically, the regulations that are proposed by this ordinance are for the safety of all users of the right of way, for those pedestrians, bicycles, vehicles that are using it, um, as well as the, uh, the others that would be camping on it. Currently, we have no regulations associated with um, uh, prohibiting camping in a vehicle on the right of way. Um, in addition to that, Martin Boise would, if we had something, would be requiring us to remove that ordinance from our code. Um, the regulations that would be required and established as a part of this would be that a vehicle has to be parked in compliance with all established parking regulations. It can't be parked within 100 feet of a private or public school, an established licensed daycare, or a public playground. Um, the vehicle is operational and can legally operate on the street. And no materials, items, supplies, waste are on the street, sidewalk, bike lane, or planting strip. 
The, plan, the, the ordinance also goes on to regulate the right-of-way by saying that no non-vehicle items, tent or other non-vehicle items, be used in the right-of-way. And the right-of-way would include the bike lanes, um, sidewalk, and planting strip, that area between the curb and sidewalk. Um, and so it's now it for a second vote on ordinance number 3164. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, move that the council adopt resolution 3164. Ordinance. Sorry, ordinance. Can we have discussion? Do we get a second? We'll have a discussion after. A second. Okay. It's a motion with a second. Council Solsby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As I stated before, um, I feel like this is a vehicle regulation that was on the books. We didn't have any anything on the books about camping in residential neighborhoods on public streets. Um, and it was always a 72 hour, you can park a vehicle. Um, I've been told all along that if we do this homeless camp that we don't have to allow people to camp in our parks. And this is another concern of mine. I, I feel like instead of saying that now it's a, a parking camping regulation. And I think we're going the opposite direction, even though we're putting in homeless shelter now. Um, and it actually says homeless population continue, whereas the homeless population continues to increase. Um, and then the council authorized a homeless shelter the, at whereas the council established overnight camping program on private and commercial land to aid with the issue. So it's my opinion that we are stepping up doing a lot more right now, but now we're wanting to change this. So it's not just leaving your car for 72 hours. Now it's regulating camping. And so I do have a problem with this. I, I cannot, uh, vote for this. I think this needs to come back to the council, in my opinion, and it should be. We wouldn't be in violation of Martin versus Boise because we're putting in a homeless shelter. We're already doing things that I was told would remedy this, and this feels like a step in the backwards direction to me. I think this should be brought back to council and fixed so that I mean, right in there, it's like some of the, um, you know, not within 100 feet of a school or a daycare. And why is that? But you can, because obviously there's a worry about someone that you don't know camping next to a school or a daycare when you don't know who this person is. Do you, as citizens, when you have small children and you'll have someone possibly camped in front of your home, it's a concern to me that... You know, you don't know who they are. Are your kids going to be able to play outside? And I, I've seen other cities where this has become a problem, where it'll be, yeah, it's only three days, but then they can move around the block, and then they can come right back. And so I just think it's something we're changing, and I know they're saying it's to tighten it up, but I think we need to be tighter than this. Councilor Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I appreciate those concerns, definitely. Um, the tack I'm on is based on an understanding that currently camping in vehicles in the public right away is permissible uh, right now, 100% uh, permissible. So if that's not the case, or if there's some nuance to that, I would seek um, someone who is aware of that to, to chime in before I continue. Yes, they are 100% um, allowed right now. It is permissible to park in the right of way in a vehicle and camp in your vehicles in Cottage Grove. Um, we do have the 72 hour requirement. That requirement stays in place with this ordinance. Um, wow. That's part of parking regulations. And then we add these additional parameters. So I would offer a friendly amendment to the motion, uh, making the vehicle parking within a thousand feet of public or private school, established licensed daycare, public playground, 
uh, and change the uh, reference to camping and right of way to camping and public right of way. The, the definition of right of way is the public right of way. That's that would be redundant. I, I don't see a need there, but that could happen and it doesn't matter. It's still the same thing. Um, we're regulating our right of way in the provision of the ordinance. A thousand feet, I think you'd be a little tough to be able to describe a thousand foot impact. A thousand, a hundred feet, we're saying we're, we're out of the way of the parking, we're out of the way of the drop off zones, we're out of the way of the extra traffic that occurs as a result of schools or daycares or, or those locations. Um, you go a thousand feet, you're going a thousand feet from the borders of the property lines of those pieces of property. Um, and you're overlapping over a considerable sizable portion of our community that way, um, much into the same area that we would be getting with um, uh, some of the other regulations that we aren't allowed to do in land use laws. Councilor Roberts. Uh, Richard, didn't we put a thousand feet distance on marijuana businesses and manufacturers to schools? Is it a thousand or five hundred, Eric? It's a thousand feet, but it's not in our ordinance. It's uh, yeah, it's state law. Yeah. Councilor, I wanted to follow up on the public rights of way. Uh, so, in section of our code twelve point zero three point zero two zero, public rights of way is defined. And public rights of way include, but are not limited to, streets, roads, highways, bridges, alleys, sidewalks, trails, paths. So we can see there's some redundancy in the language there. Public easements and all other public ways or areas, including subsurfaces under the airspace over these areas. And that's referencing an ordinance from 96. In the last council meeting, I asked about the paths and uh, the bike paths and the different trails along and i i would open it to you to re reiterate what, how you responded to that mr myers yeah those are all right um the, the public right of way is any of those pieces of property now we have some properties that we use as um, paths and stuff, but they are fee simple property, um, title owned property, and those don't necessarily fit into the public right of way rules um, unless we've designated them a, a right of way. Um, but yeah, our our bike path, our others like that are right of way and and alineated that way. So I, you know, under state law, we're looking at the right of way definition there. Um, I don't know if the state, I don't think the state law public in front of the right of way provisions. We can put it on. I mean, th there's not a problem there. It just sometimes it may be redundant. It might the be helpful to be that redundant. More specific question is a definition of the public areas. Because in just a, a layman's reading of that, I would think that a park, a designated park is a public area. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a right of way. It is a park. It is land that is um, designated separately um, and not classified as the public right of way. When they're talking public ways or areas, they're they're specifically tying it into things that are meant for the the thoroughfare of traffic. Miss um, Conley wants to chime in, Mr. Myers. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Conley. Thanks. I just, um, it, it's actually making me nervous to try to correlate the two different sections of the city code between Title 10 and then Title 12, which accomplish two different things. So were the council to want to entertain this type of change, I would want to look at it really carefully to make sure we're not having unintended consequences. And my other concern is that um, by, so, so leaving it as rights of way makes it really clear that is all city streets, um, any dedicated right of way that is within the city jurisdiction to extend it um, 
to the public rights of way as defined in Title 12. Because of that reference to public places um, that Councillor Irvin was just pointing to, we may be having, again, an unintended impact of um, instead of trying to comply with Martin v. Boise and HB 3115, we might instead be drawing a challenge of adopting an ordinance that um, would be unreasonable from the perspective of a homeless individual. So what we're wanting to do is kind of add this area to our, um, to the city's, sorry, not our, but to the city's inventory of locations where individuals can um, sleep, lie, rest, etc., while instituting really defensible um, parameters like uh, city manager Myers was pointing out around schools to not um, interfere with the parking and the you know drop offs and pickups etc that's a really defensible time place and manner restriction um, so I'm, I'm sorry I just it's, it's just a lot to it's more than you might think to make this very very what looks to be a minor change yeah I guess I would say it's kind of exactly what I thought it was um, I was told that this was the same thing at the outset of this conversation and when I pushed on it to call out specifically why I was doing that now it's a problem um, so why don't and I don't I would push back that it is not clear especially now what right away means because it's now undefined I looked in the code for right of way and it was defined specifically as private or a public right away, but now this use of right away in, in section 10 is undefined, except for um, including bike lanes, sidewalks, and planting strips. So are we saying that that is the definition now of right away, which is distinct from public right away? Well, the intent is to just make a very, very minor tweak because the, your traffic ordinance um, relies on state law. And so I can't, the Oregon Vehicle Code, I'm unable this quickly to determine exactly what that is under state law. In, 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 title, in title 10, in, in chapter 10.040, um, 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 in the definitions, we have street, and it says street means highway, road, street, or alley as defined in ORS, and then it gives the, the different sites in um, the Oregon Vehicle Code, including the entire width of the right-of-way. Um, and so we could change the way to be street, and that would probably be more consistent with this definition, but the... Um, with, 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 all those ORSs and see what it says on right of way. That, so right of way is defined in 801.440. Um, which is and that's right of way for a vehicle, not for the right of way. But yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just trying to find cross referenced um, definitions to to try to address the concern that it is an undefined term so that statute states right of way means the right of one vehicle or pedestrian to proceed in a lawful manner in preference to another vehicle or pedestrian approaching under similar such circumstances of direction speed mm. so that one's not applicable here yeah but again no, yeah. that's why i can't no. <laughs> we i don't want to analyze on the spot what ch changes to an ordinance that's going to become part of your code um, do we want to make on the spot? So I, that's my, my caution is that there are so many nuanced things going on here and it's all left to the interpretation of the force of the will um, of those implementing. And, you know, some of this council and some of the residents are representing a position which is we do want the parks um, and their original intended function to be uh, preserved. And there's this kind of, in my opinion, a nebulous definition of 
I, you might agree, of um, totality of the circumstances surrounding, which we don't have defined. And we now have a shelter. We have a community group that's also willing to, to help in some ways. We're going to be entertaining an RFP uh, or a proposal elicited by the RFP. And I think a lot of us want to know, when do we get, what is the out, outlook here? I would like to see some, some steps taken to preserve the use of the parks. Um, and when I read this, I can think in my mind, oh, well, this is what this is going to do. But it turns out, nope, it isn't what it's going to do. Um, and I know we talked about, um, because apparently this definition doesn't apply. Because uh, if it did, which is why you're cautious right now, Mrs. Conley, because now it interferes with, now it actually does <laughs> mean that you can't have a tent set up in a park uh, if it actually meant public right away. Uh, so there's, I guess I want to just express that I want some more clarity on these things. All of these words apparently matter very much. Um, and I think we should define all the terms and have that at our disposal before making decisions. Councilor Savage. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, two different thoughts uh, in this conversation that Councilor Irving is bringing on. It made me realize, is there a difference between a bike path and a bike lane? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, except one is on the street, but another one is a form of transportation that we have been very cognizant about creating crossways on major thoroughfares, such as on Gateway, we have the signals, and then on Route River, we have more signals for pedestrians. Um, so that thought crossed my mind. The other thought that I had in, in a, I want to throw out two different scenarios, and I don't know if this changes anything, but under the current code right now, if somebody was in their vehicle, in their RV, that legally drives and legally meets all the parameters, they haven't been there for three days, and they up and leave, and it's, it's now abandoned on city property, who's responsible for cleaning that up under the code now? And then the same question applies to if this were to pass, does that change? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm curious. And we are responsible to remove abandoned vehicles off our streets. Um, that's part of our enforcement. If we have a vehicle that doesn't move, we'll tag it and go through that process. And if they don't remove it, then we get to tow it. And um, under the regulations or the notices that we've received from the towing companies, they will no longer tow um, RVs because of the excessive cost associated with removing them and going through the process of getting title and then decommissioning and cleaning them up and the storage space they require, um, they won't do that. So we'll have to have them towed to our own property, um, have a hazardous materials company come in after we've gotten title um, to come in, assess whether there's any hazards there, clean up anything that needs to be removed, and then we can have them demolished and pay for somebody to demolish them. Um, much the same as a regular vehicle, but a regular vehicle is not the extent of an RV. Um, we currently, we have spent, uh, the last one that we had to do and um, hit about $2,800, I believe, to have it taken care of. Um, that is a problem that's hitting communities all over the country um, where people are abandoning um, RVs that are now not worth anything and actually cost to get rid of and they're parking them on streets. Um, at, over the last 10 years, 10 years ago, people were doing it with boats. Um, and we didn't see RVs as much, but um, it's kind of changed now and we're starting to see RVs. And people would abandon a, a large boat on public land and or in private parking lots. Um, the transom would rot and the boat is now worth nothing and disposal costs more to get rid of it than um, they want to do and they'll just about abandon them. And there's, people do it with cars, but their cars are a little easier to take care of and handle. So just to clarify, it's the same scenario regardless. Yep. City's on the hook. Okay, right, thank you. Yep. Um, I'd like to circle back to what Councilor Solsby first said, uh, your first comment. I understand completely that it feels like it's going in the wrong direction, but I would like you to consider um, specifically youth who don't fit into HUD's Category 1 definition of homelessness. 
which means that they don't, um, they haven't been on the streets for long enough or um, if you are at risk of homelessness or if you're couch surfing, you don't fit into HUD's definition one. And a lot of homeless service, homelessness services for youth that are in um, the Lane County area do not serve any youth who do not fit into that category one, which is a really hard requirement to reach. And so for a lot of those kids, they don't have a lot of options. And one of the options that they do have is maybe they do have a vehicle or maybe they have a friend's vehicle that they are able to stay in. And so just some, I think that that is an option that we shouldn't completely take away from them. I understand where you're coming from. I'm looking at this in the big picture right mm -hmm. now. Every action that we're taking has a reaction. And as a youth, I can tell you we have a community here that would rally around you and if you needed a driveway to park in or a piece of land and that's why we just passed um, a new ordinance that says that the homeowner can let you camp even in their backyard they can let you camp in the driveway um, and especially being a resident of Cottage Row I do not believe that any youth would have a hard time finding someone that would give them a piece of property and um, as I'd like to now circle back to, um, I, I get told that I ask too many questions and that I should trust what the city manager says, I should trust the attorney. And this is really frustrating to me because, you know, I was hearing the city manager say that what Councilor Irvin was talking about and his language was redundant and you know if we were just to trust and pass something you know we have to ask these questions it's really important everything that we're doing right now is our citizens are at stake and I mean everyone I'm not we're, we're doing things for the homeless situation obviously and um, like I said that last ordinance that we passed on um, you know so somebody can give you permission and um, what I want to protect is, and I had actually talked to Taylor's Towing, and they did tell me that it was costing about $3,000 per vehicle to get rid of. And circling back uh, to Councillor Savage's question, if a mess was left behind, who would be responsible to clean it? And you're talking in front of your homes now. So, you know, all these things we do have to take into account. And... Take it very seriously, and I thank you for doing your Councilor Urban. Councilor Fleck. So I guess the one point, and and Carrie can, or Ms. Conley can, you know, verify. But you know, if this did go to the court, uh, the court is going to look at what was the legislative intent. Um, I know that I've seen this in bills from the legislature. Um, you know, that being said, I am totally fine putting this off to a future meeting. Um, and I guess so uh, uh, for point of order, if I withdrew my motion and the second withdrew theirs, could we bring this back at the next meeting? Okay, so I, I withdraw my motion. Council Roberts, you withdraw your second. <laughs> I'm having a problem with this 100 feet of school. That's not much space. So do you want to withdraw your second and we'll put it off till the next meeting? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So we'll revisit that. So does that mean that staff is going to relook at this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Stan. Can, can I ask a question? I just want to understand your, your concern. Um, and can we just go down to something else? Um, so you're concerned that the right of way may Maybe it being interpreted as a park, as a better than a park, versus might be interpreted as the public right of way. I was kind of hoping that it would. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now I'm concerned that it won't. Okay. It's kind of seems to me the right of way first to travel in the you know, Yeah. So a lesson from a longtime Portland friend about moving quickly across land as you walk in straight lines. And I understand parks to be anywhere in a public area is a lane of travel. It's 
it's a mode of getting. There are paths set up for people to walk on, maybe with disabilities or that are more mobile than others. But the whole public area is a place for residents, the public, to, to move freely. And setting up and impediments, for me, there's, there's some classifications that seem reasonable. Um, so this is subjective. You know, place structures, designated areas, um, infrastructure. Those are kind of the carve-outs for impediments to free travel through parks. When you start populating them with tents and other obstructions that can be movable, that that you don't know where they are. What if you're traveling through night? That there's an unexpected thing that creates a hazard uh, for for the intended use of the parks, which is that's why I think they're defined as a right of way. It's a, a place of free travel. It's in the same vein as as all of these other things that are listed streets roads highways bridges alleys sidewalks trails paths and all this so i don't see these parks as different than that and i think the code doesn't see them as different than that and i'd like to see it preserved i welcome the clarification thank you okay brings us to item eight business from the city council contract award for the 99 emergency shelter mr myers um, we put out our RFP uh, and we've received one um, proposal uh, in response. Um, you've been provided a, a real quick summary of that as well as a copy of the, 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 the proposal that was submitted. Um, carry it forward, uh, submitted the proposal um, to run the Highway 99 um, emergency shelter facility and, and provide services there. Um, for a total of $200,000, not to exceed $200,000 each year. The first year will be a nine-month year. Um, their budget estimate is about $153,000. Um, the second year is um, the budgeted X number is $204,000, I believe, um, $1,000. Um, page here. Um, Two hundred and four thousand three hundred and seventy dollars. Um, so they're but they're proposing in their contract that it would be um, no more than two hundred thousand dollars in in each full year. Um, would be less in the first year because it's only nine months. Uh, it's for a forty bed forty person bed, um, no more than forty people um, facility, um, housed in in the shelters and operated twenty four seven. Okay, I have um, three people signed up. Bruce Kelch. I mean, there we go. <clears throat> um, Bruce Kelch, 78340, Holderman Road. The uh, council approved the Highway 99 site with a five to two vote as the best option moving forward in addressing the homelessness situation in the city. As with all council decisions in which there is a split vote, the council should demonstrate unity in implementing the chosen plan and show support for the project. In its proposal, carried forward is addressed concerns council has raised in the past. 24-7 management, an organization, an organization with extensive experience in serving the unhoused, wraparound services, support, and plans to move clients from their present circumstances to stability, skills training, employment, and more permanent housing. Choosing Carry It Forward to be the provider and manager of the Highway 99 shelter is clearly the logical and best next step for the city. Winter is coming. Time is of the essence. The need is great as the weather changes and living conditions for the unhoused become even more challenging. The council, spent, the council spent a long time considering its options and outlining what it desires in terms of a managed site. Carry It Forward meets the criteria and should be the agency chosen to manage the Highway 99 site. Thank you. Thank you. Johanna Z. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you for the statement that I think um, Richard Myers actually made about the incident. That, I think that was well thought of. Incident. So where do I start with um, this first, I just want to respond to Bruce Kelsch, uh, the demonstrating unity. I'd also thought about that. You know, we don't have a consensus decision-making process. It is a voting process. So it wasn't, there was no consensus. So just because two people decided 
they didn't like it, they should not necessarily demonstrate unity. That's not how your process actually works. And the other is this idea that there's a crisis again. Um, this is always what it is, crisis, crisis, we must act and do something. Community Strong Cottage Grove actually has brought forth different ideas and we continue to talk about solutions. An example of a community response, which this is not, this is the housing first response with harm reduction, is there was um, one of the unhoused uh, had a broken arm, you know, and not with a fight with um, um, any law enforcement or anything, but with a fight with another person, um, unhoused person. So he had a broken arm and he was um, a meth addict, he is a meth addict. And when I saw him with the broken arm, I mean, his complexion was good and everything it was like, wow. And I just, I realized he got clean. He was in the hospital, he got clean. A healthy community response would be communication with the community so that we could have supported him. And instead of putting him back into a tent, we could have helped him with transitional housing and maybe gotten him, um, you know, onto a better situation. Um, so that was pretty sad to see that as was the next person our outreach team, which a lot of people are talking about having and how wonderful that is doing, that would be to have is something that we actually are doing as an outreach team. Um, seeing the next gentleman who actually did not have an arm because he was shooting up and lost it because of abscesses. Um, and yet that's not enough to keep people off of this because we don't have a homeless issue, we have a drug problem in this community. It's a drug problem, not a housing issue. Most of these kids out there, these young people out, out there have a place they could go to. They have family in this community. Um, you know, which that woman said earlier, send them back where they came from. Well, a lot of them are from here. They went to school here and people know them. So I would hazard to say that they have places and we have spoken to it as long as they were clean, but not allowed in those places um, because of their addiction issues. So I just wanted to, um, you know, I don't know how the process works. I say there's a time of protesting this proposal and I don't know if they're formally protesting. I don't know if it's you guys to protest or for us to protest. My biggest concern with this is um, that it's not a 24 seven staffed site. Um, that is the biggest concern. There's already safety concerns out there, um, but they're saying they might have remote cameras. Well, where are the people gonna be? How are people, if it's three o'clock in the morning, they want to get in there, they can't get in there. The other is that they're not going to accept certain sex offenders or violent people. Well, you know what, that, where are they going to go? They're going to go back to the parks. So please be aware that just because you have a shelter, number one, doesn't mean you can just ship them off to the shelter. It's up to them, but they're not allowed to be in the parks. Unless, of course, that shelter is full, and now we have a lot of people out there, twice as many as we did. Um, I think a month and a half ago. So if it's full, then they can be in the parks. If they've been kicked out of the shelter, then they can be in the parks, um, among other reasons. So this is great. There's a lot of buzzwords. My other biggest concern is that it's carried forward. And I'm not surprised. Why is there only one proposal? What happened to St. Vincent's? And where are carried forward? Are they here today? Not part of our community. None of these guys on here are part of our community. There's, they have no investment in the people here. They're just being paid. And that's where the community approach brings in the people to support um, people so that they can have a network um, of people. I'm very concerned. This is a very woke agency. Laurel O'Rourke is on the board. She's also on the board of the 4J School District. And you know, this is like a whole sheet of comments that she makes. Um, and there's many grievances against her. And this is just an example. You know, birds of a feather flock together, right? So. Um, if I'm kind enough to tell you you're racist, you are either in my way, in my way, or I like you enough to educate you, or white Eugene is not working against systemic racism, you're working for it. Um, and those are some of the more mild comments. Um, she believes everybody is um, racist and white supremacy. And in this proposal here, which I don't really understand, but I guess I do understand, you're accepting grant money, right? In 20 seconds. So there's strings attached. So you're asking all about equity. Well, what are you doing for equity? What are you doing for COVID? And these are not issues necessarily that affect our community here. This is all about the strings attached with the grants. So again, um, I hope we have more time to talk about this. This sounds wonderful, but it's these buzzwords. Um, the last thing I do want to say is that, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, is that Councillor Fleck, you need to recuse yourself. I know that you say there's a potential or an actual you know, conflict of interest, but that's where the letter of the law 
you know, we need to look at what is the right thing to do. And this is your business and you are invested in this and you have a community sharing has a partnership with um, Carry It Forward. And they were slated to have this the whole time. So I really question this whole process. They were slated. They were walked around and they chose the property. They chose it. So thank you. Venice Mason. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry I'm out of line. I'm hard of hearing. And I cannot hear what people are saying unless they speak closely to the microphone and not speak so fast. I'm not getting any of this. Okay. So I just ask for people to speak to the microphone and speak slowly and clearly, not extra slowly, but just clear. Thank you. My name is Venice Mason, and I will slow it down. I get very nervous speaking here. I live at 28 South 6th Street, Old City Hall building. First of all, I want to um, commend the council for putting through the homeless shelter that we need. A lot of the issues that we're hearing about this evening are interrelated issues, and I think that we t tend to take things personally. Um, Carry It Forward is an organization that is qualified to do the work as we build what we need in the community. I think some of our counselors are a bit out of touch with reality if they think that anybody would just give someone a piece of property. I think that that statement is just blatantly out of touch with reality. Um, having been homeless, having been a homeless youth, there's no one out handing out property. Not everybody owns the things that you do. Um, that just isn't reality. However, I do believe that what we're dealing with here is a systemic issue, and a lot of people are taking this personally. They're taking a look at it as poor character. These are interrelated issues. You have mentioned, you know, comorbidity, Councilor Solsby, and it's actually trimorbid. It has to do with mental health, it has to do with addiction, and it has to do with poverty. I serve on the um, Oregon Food Bank's Black, Indigenous, and People of Leadership program. We're looking to address the root causes of hunger. In order to do that, two of the main issues is not just handing out food, but being able to deal with the issues of houselessness and environmental issues. All of the decisions that you have made have been the best decisions that you could make with a huge amount of community input with a huge amount of public effort, with the joint efforts of everything. And I'd like to also address the comments that are made that say that Councilor Fleck has a conflict of interest. Councilor Fleck, in my experience, has a concentration of interest in this community. He works in these services and has a, what's called a concentration of interest. He absolutely has more expertise and knowledge in this arena than most people who aren't dealing with houseless people on a daily basis for the last 11 years as director of the sole social services agency outside of DHS in this town. So I do not always agree with him by any means. We don't agree politically, philosophically, but I've heard so many times about this conflict of interest, and I would say that it's a concentration of interest and that it's been used wisely. I do believe that we should accept the uh, Carry It Forward proposal for our RFP in order to get our homeless shelter running. I also think that we need to do some public education to handle the tension that's in the city. If you listen to the radio, there's people drumming up interest in taking back our parks because the police can do nothing. The bottom line is, is whether we like it or not, the courts in America have ruled that homeless people have rights, a right to sleep, a right to be, a right to exist, a right to not be kicked out, to not be beaten, to not be shoved under a rug, and to not be treated as second-class citizens, despite their many problems. That is the new reality. And the new reality is that people with lived experience are the new leaders. These are environmental refugees. The environment of systems of oppression create poverty, homelessness, addiction, and compound the issues of mental health and poverty and hunger in our communities. I see this shelter as an amazing opportunity. And I'd like to thank the council um, for letting me do a tour of the facility. And I'm very much looking forward to putting in gardens that will help to give the best to those who need it most in our community. Thank you for allowing the shelter to go through. And I wholeheartedly hope that Carry It Forward does a better job than we have so far. Thank you. Comments? Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I know I voted for the 99 site, but I'm having a lot of trouble with paying almost a third of a million dollars over two years. And it's not, there's no, I mean, there needs to be someone there 24 7 I don't like this spot of camera time. Yeah, that bothers me. Um, I was hoping for more of an RV that was actually going to be, uh, and I went to their program up in Virginia. I, I'd like to see a little bit more of them tackling the problem of stuff that people have that are going to be coming in there. I'm, I'm just a little bit wary now uh, when I saw that some of these ships might be watched by camera, um, basically un yeah, unattended. Um, I mean, with that kind of money, are they having a hard time finding people to work? I know a lot of people, a lot of companies are. Um, they can hire me. I'll do it. Um, but that, that's troubling for me. Um, and then I, I really think the other thing that's sort of bothering me the last few days is I think this council needs to work up a policy of what we're going to do with the overflow. I think the council should do that. Because I'm really worried about some of us saying we want to do this and help these people, but then we're going to find people back in the park. And that's very troubling to me. So I think that, uh, I still think there's a lot of work to be done on this. I mean, I do want to help these folks. I really do. I want to give them a chance because not all of them are messed up. So that's what I have. Anyone want to add to that? Councilor Fleck. So I guess, uh, you know, start with the question of ethics. Um, as I mentioned all along, uh, community sharing has no intention of applying for this RFP. And, and as you can see, we, we did not apply for this RFP. Uh, community sharing is mentioned as a supporting agency, but we've had no discussions about compensation at all. So basically, uh, we will help with uh, getting food over uh, so the carry forward can take care of that is the only discussions we've had. So there, there is actually no conflict of interest at this point, uh, potential or actual. So, so saying that for the record, um, I will also express some concern about 24/7 uh, folks on the site. I actually agree with that concern myself. Um, I, I would not want to see shifts uh, with with a camera. So, so that's a little bit of a concern for me as well. Um, uh, and I guess I'll just kind of stop there and listen to the rest of the council comments. Mr. Myers. So I want to I want to address some of that, and we also have Chris um, and Arwen with us in the audience. I believe Arwen's with Chris as well, um, and they can answer what they meant there with that. Um, we are intending to have. Um, the full shifts, but there will be times when people are at lunch or on break or something that are there on the site that will be monitored as well by camera. So they'll have a backup with the assistance there. Chris can address that a little bit more. Um, Carry It Forward has been in the community for a number of years. Um, they have been helping with us, uh, helping us with different parts of addressing. When we had the facility at the community center, Howard, one of their, their outreach people would come through and help us. They help us with the shower facility as well. Um, they have been a part of this community and they continue to be a part. They're not looking at trying to create some big giant metropolis operation corporate thing of helping homelessness. They are wanting to help the individuals and that's what they do. Um, we did work through the site with a number of other agencies. We've been working with Square One, we've worked with St. Vincent de Paul, but they just decided they have too many things going on. Square One Village is, is working on a new $14 million project and so I imagine they're just kind of swamped and that's why they didn't respond. Um, St. Vincent de Paul has also been um, meeting with us and seeing what we're doing and knows what's happening, um, but they're currently busy with other projects as well. So Carry It Forward was the one that responded. Shelter Care, we didn't hear anything from Shelter Care um, as a result. This RFP was sent out to every agency, every organization in Lane County um, that would have been interested or would have any way of um, dealing with um, providing these kinds of services um, throughout the community. Um, it's also important to note, and there was comment made that, oh, yeah, we'll just have these tents set up out there. There's no tents on this property. These are going to be pallet shelters. Um, they will have um, 
the shower trailer. They'll have showers and restrooms and hygiene. Um, this will be a, a facility that will be taking care of the needs of these people to help them get back on their feet. It is not a place to dump them and stick them away um, in a tent and create other problems and kind of somebody hasn't been look at the site or been by it apparently if that's what they think it's going to be um, so Chris is here um, and he could be he could answer any questions regarding the, the staffing if you have questions on that um, it is a two-year agreement um, to give us the opportunity to see how it goes see what happens um, as we work through what's happening with the legislation in the court cases Councilor Roberts so I mean like what my questions are if, if, if they're under just camera surveillance and something happens, what is the response time to this? I mean, does, does Carry Forward have to notify our police department or does our police also have the feed coming into them? I mean, that's what worries me, you know? I mean, we've had instances, I rolled with our police um, while you were on your conference and uh, witnessed an incident in in the park that they had to go to along with South Lake. They handled it very well, I will say, but there was a time before they got there, you know, and I'm just worried about that. And that was the thing that I was hoping and for this was that there will be somebody there that can handle this. And that's basically sort of what they told me when I visited their Eugene place. So I, I, I feel, and then if something does happen under and there's nobody there to respond to it. Uh, I mean, how does that affect the contract? I mean, I mean, once if we agree to this, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I feel that for this kind of money and for what we're trying to achieve with helping these people, that there has to be people there 24 seven. I'm sorry. That's just my feelings on this. I mean, the program I went to, they never left us out. Never, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Chris McAllister, and the executive director for Carry Forward. I understand the wording may be a little bit confusing, so let me please explain. We offer remote surveillance for all of our camps. We have someone looking at all of our extra camps to help with breaks. When someone runs down the street for a few minutes, we tend to have someone be able to be supervised immediately for <clears throat> no more than 10 minutes of divergence from the schedule. People have to use bathroom or things like that. So many people on a small site, we want to make sure that there's always staff there. This is just the people that we are paying for this. As stated, we had to work within the $200,000 for things. We are taking a loss, are taking portions of this, so we wanted to make sure that we are complementing and supplementing with some of our support services. Our case managers would be available on site. They're not factored into these costs. Some of our other support staff, some of our therapy, some of our drug and alcohol counselors, some of the volunteers, because they're not factored into these costs. And so we are accommodating through what we ask for for the budget. And we are also working with partnerships such as the local community or um, gardening and some of the other people who had asked to be more involved. So again, we do plan on having 24 seven people on staff, but sometimes if someone needs to step to use the bathroom, they're technically still on site. Our other camps, we have within 10 minutes response time from anybody here. So if you are on lunch and in the town of Potts Grove at Fairy Queen, um, you have enough time to get right back, but we have someone who's responsible. They see something, they call 911. They hit any of the safety plans as stated by our contract. So I'm open for any other questions. Councilor Solsby. Thank you, Chris. Um, so when I read your proposal, it said, um, we do not deny services due to criminal history. That said, we do not take level three sex offenders or people with violent criminal history. Um, we determine if a person is fit based on behaviors and interests in the, and working on a positive goal. So my question is, I believe you can't run background checks. And so how do you know if they're a level three sex offender or if they have a violent history or what do you consider violent history? 
business folks which will be um there's a state database in regards to sex offenders and whether you are level one level two or level three or currently not classified we currently did this massive review and there's still people being classified um but uh we go by that database we also go by records we are able to do criminal backgrounds if uh, we have the money to do so we are able to do so we have an account if we have to as it means for most of our kind of contracts do that from us on our staff or a lot of clients if that's the need for the program so there is that capacity am um, i mistaken to did i misread that that it's not that you you can't do criminal background checks as part of the, the rfp to turn people away we I thought able, I read that. We're not being required to do it at this point. We are able to do background checks if there was a concern about a process. And so we cannot do so free. So there's not a list that we can look up each individual to see where they are with that component other than sex offenders. Sex offenders, we are protected for our communities to be able to look up on that capacity. So basically, and, and you're just looking at a sex offender list and you, you take their ID when they come in. We have to for the state uh, verified through the HMIS program, which is also the federal funding that we look up our folks. Anybody who does not have an issue, we, we have ways to back up. So if you have a social security number, we can look through all those things are captured when you are listed as a sex Hello. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is how many on-site staff do you have at any given time? Is it one? We have between one to six depending on what we're doing during the day and through the capacity. Uh, okay. And um, my second question was, we're talking about uh, HMIS. Do you do front door evaluations? Yes, we currently do. And that's a great question. Front door assessments, we do. Uh, we are one of the people who did the front door assessments here in Cottage Grove and throughout East Lane County and Street for the last year. Okay, thank you. Councilor Irvin, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And welcome, Chris. Good to see you again. Will you describe the strategy for managing the um, shelter's availability for freezing nights? Are you going to keep a vacancy rate in order to have capacity to take in uh, people for on the freezing nights, or how is that addressed in the proposal? Sir, sure. so thank you for that question. We've been asked to do a year round emergency shelter for the five hundred residents. So with that in mind, our goal is to make sure that people don't need beds on crazy nights if we have availability in our shelter. So with that being said, we also have space inside the building as well as the ability to possibly shelter folks on crazy nights in other spaces as well as I've committed to uh, the city that if we are still being supported with our method that we'd be happy to support with staffing our volunteers in other church events or here on crazy nights. So wanting to work within whatever the kind of network is. We're not here to redefine new results support you as you find your way. Councilor Stennett, how, how much space would you say you have in the building in case we needed any cold night? As we have not taken possession of the building and not seen where the uh, construction has uh, been finished or where it is, um, we looked at the square footage. Anyone know how many people were registered in, in the uh, account? So 22 people last year, two people from Eugene or wherever, 20 from here. If, 30, if 20 of them are in the 33 units that we are being told are going to be there, we have floor space for several people. There are also a couple of units that we're talking about for a little bit bigger room with people who had mental health uh, or other needs to have more space to be uh, separate from there. So we could possibly turn units there in an emergency. We also have uh, a portable unit that we could bring you on site that is co developed with our own village builder. And uh, we'd be happy to find whatever strategy is most Thank you. Councilor Roberts, thank you for being here. I didn't see you hiding in the back there. Um, once again, I had a good time, and you really explained to me up in Eugene. I just wonder if you could explain to a lot of the people in the room uh, and here on council what it's like in a day there, you know, pretty much, and then how, like you explained to me, how the counselors are there, for what reasons, uh, then the community kitchen, sort of a little bit, a synops short synopsis of how it works. Yes, sir. Thank you. A day in the life of a carry forth camp usually starts at morning shift at 8 a.m. Breakfast team rolls in. Sometimes we have someone who wants to cook. Other times we just open up the kitchen, make sure the showers are available. Case manager starts to come in, works with a couple of people on their caseload. Maybe they're following up on a voucher. Maybe they're looking at replacing their ID and need to get into the list. We start the laundry van. There's laundry that's going to go out to the site. We're going to work on that. 
people who have had volunteer duties and sign up for shifts. Those who can't or are unable to, they're doing their own thing. Sometimes we'll bring in a counselor for them. Sometimes they are going out to site with the right source or here in Todd Grove with your local uh, right lane um, <clears throat> options. Uh, we have the ability for folks to bring in um, classes through telemedicine and through the uh, computer network, tablets, if you're working on a class for your uh, schooling, we have availability for that. We have for each section a dedicated hotspot, so you can be able to do some of the things that you need to do. It's not going to be about access point. So then you go into meals, you can cook for yourself, or we have some people who are qualified for meals on meals. We don't navigate for that. Afternoon team comes in, we have people who want to focus on arts, on doing a workshop, maybe do some gardening. We have some vocational people uh, coming in wanting to do some skill building. We were, we're working with job specialists with the employment center to help coordinate with teams and help people find local work in their communities. Um, if you need a pair of boots to go work at the mill, we have to line you up with that. We have drugs and uh, alcohol support staff to come help people work through their issues. Some people come to our camps to be clean because we don't let people be actively using our sites. It's about being behaviors. We bring in counselors to come through. People find the different counselors and different styles work for them. We help navigate through that. So we're very case management driven. About uh, evening time, overnight team comes in. They tend to make sure safety, they do more walkabouts. They are more about documenting, checking with the remote team. What did I see? Who just came in? Is that a bike that we looked at? I noticed a dog. That person doesn't usually have a dog. What's going on? And so we check in and go against the record. Morning comes around, we do the exchange. Who was not able to sleep last night? Was to who's call? Is there anything that we need to do? And the day starts again. We have a robust team of people 24 7 to make sure that the needs are addressed. If we need to bring someone in from our other site, someone who has more de escalation training, we have the ability to transport them that night within about a half hour turnaround towards here. We share our resources with Cut and Grow because we are a network system. We don't just serve one now. I'm a spring builder. My people's needs are not met. In Springfield. My people's needs are having to go through your team. I support the hometown feel. You guys know what your people need. We just want to make sure that it's real for you. Emma? Um, you said that they have a team of staff. Is that staff that is already hired? A team staff? You said you had a team of staff. Is yes. that staff that is already hired and ready to? Yes. Okay. We've been on the same bike since February. Okay. Um, can you go over your uh, details quickly about your plan for retention of staff? Yes, that's great. As we've taken on different camps, we want to make sure that we leave nobody behind. So we only go after models that pair up in the same style that we have, so that we are able to keep our, our wages the same and be able to add for uh, benefits as we take on multiple camps. We look more local services. We started to train and do a little bit of uh, outreach, and so most of our staff we're going to be trained to be community healthcare workers. So that will allow us to build um, OHP for some of our supports, as well as do some of our assessments. And with that, that will allow us to save money and ask for more dollars that will go into benefits. And so we're looking at having local benefits, and we pay more than uh, we are looking at establishing a minimum wage of um, about $18 to start. And so we know that things are costly more in rural areas. We know that a lot of access to services. It's a lot more expensive going to the big cities to uh, get more access. So we want to make sure people coming here or working here, and even wanting to work for us here, could be uh, welcome. So more benefits by having more contracts serving in an effective and cohesive way, while also minimizing costs by utilizing cameras and other support teams across the whole line. Thank you. Councilor Roberts. Once again, that's great explanations. Um, how hard or easy is it going to be for organizations here in the community college group churches to volunteer and help with this uh, project out on 99 will they be able to do that because from what i'm understanding there are people that want to help and um how you'll deal with that will be like an orientation or so we welcome volunteers who agree to supporting the dignity of everybody who's involved keeping the privacy of those involved and helping people grow in the way that's conducive to their own personal growth. So with that in mind, after we get our feet on the ground and our understanding of what's available to the site, we would be a welcoming 
training and opportunities to join as volunteers. So it would be the streamlined across the board for any of us. And you think you reached the goal, right, to yes. the end? Because we've had people over the last, uh, how long have we been discussing this, seven, eight months, saying that it's a community problem. So you know, it'd be great to see some of these organizations that have uh, had good, some good things to say uh, to, get, to get involved. I can't thank you enough. I'm really sorry I did not see you. I apologize. Councilor Solsby. What is, okay, so what, a, what has been a big issue for me is that there's no requirement at all to get into any kind of drug treatment or alcohol treatment. And that bothers me because I feel like in order to, for them to really be successful in life, they have to break that habit. And I realize that they fall back in and have, you know, go backwards and, and that'll happen. But I am very skeptical of a program that will give you all the benefits without requiring the um, making you get into something um, that could really help you get off a substance that's ruining your life. And so, um, how do you go about that? Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that's a very, very deep question, and I'm just going to reiterate that when someone is ready and able to enter treatment, that is transformative. And so the average person who's fighting and truly fighting the struggle relapses at least seven times before they're able to kick it. So being able to be that safe spot for them to be able to continue to keep trying. Now behaviors are what get people expelled from our camps. Behaviors. So if you are untreated on meds and your behaviors are gone, or if you just had a really bad day at work and you want to go pull off Steve and you take it off on my staff, on a community member or a fellow client, then we need you to go take your cool off and, and go collect your head. And so if someone is not able to be in the community, then we want to try and find your help and get you some support. Maybe that's a uh, Conestoga at a, at a crisis spot. Maybe it's checking in with our brothers and sisters down at uh, South Lane. The options are determined by our community and what we're able to do as a community. So we cannot force people to go into treatment. We find that when we do, they don't get better. It gets worse and they are more likely to do the behaviors that are really railed against in our communities. And so we want to make sure that it's okay to be in recovery, that we give every option and availability to do it. We have medical, we have mental health and substance use professionals both integrated into our staff, integrated into our policies, and integrated into our outlets. And so if I can't handle something with my team, I don't just step back and go, and have others. I try and find the solution, because these are all of our people, and it's just a displaced problem if I move it down the road and don't call it out. And so I can't make people get into treatment any more than I can make people take their meds, vote the way I want, or drive on the right side of it. That said, we do what we can when the people are there, and we are motivation and traction based. Our camps are called SPOT, Shelters Prioritizing Onward Traction. We want people who are motivated to work and work hard. We will work as hard as our people, but we can't work harder than our people. And so we have a requirement of case management to check in with your case manager at least every couple of weeks, if not every week. If there's goals because you're waiting on your social security, we get you with next. We get you with the people you need to have help. And so sometimes it's getting the stability that allows sobriety to start to come. You can have a place to deal with the withdrawals and the feelings in the darkness and not feel like you're going to be chased out and be made to go at 7 in the morning and find out what you're going to do during the day. So being in that safe space, having access to care, having access to a network that will go beyond its own network if we need to, that's what I think is the answer to that. So um, I also read in, read in your proposal that it said you had um, South Lane Mental Health and Laurel Hill pledged interest in assisting with access to mental health services for clients. And I do know the waiting list is months out to get into South Lane Mental Health. And so I um, question, do you have other, because you say you have drug 
experts and, mm -hmm. and mental health. You have other people on your team that will be there besides? So we, uh, we recently were part of a, a collaborative grant with OIT dollars. There's also one ten dollars that allow the funding for a team of uh, mental health and substance use uh, counselors to come into any care for camp. So it's dialed money for our projects. And so they're working in concert with our low barrier, but graduated and complete care model. And so we are working with professionals there. We also have relationships with Laurel Hill because of the fact that we all utilize the same outreach and crisis and triage models. We are, as part of the Cottage Grove Irish Triage team, we are some of the teams that come and help problem solve for people who can't get their needs met here to go and to get their help at uh, Lane County Behavioral Health or send the forensic investigation team to help get a prescriber so they get on their meds. We have ways and we're utilizing the system to tied into the backbone of what the county does off. But they're not, they're not um, full employees, you contract it out. They are saying. services that are already contracted in the county. Okay. So and we also have, they aren't part of our employees, but we so, can just actually like Southland Mental Health, mm -hmm. so it's others just contracted out. But we do, but we do have people who are scheduled to come in. Today we had one of the counselors come in tonight to speak with people who have specific needs for them. Tomorrow we have someone coming in during the afternoon. On Saturday we have a prescriber coming to see if there's anybody who's already on their list that they need to renew. I'm sorry, forgive me, this is new. I, I haven't talked with you before. When you say a per prescriber, Coming in, what, what, what do you mean by that? Okay, so some people have already established care, uh, whether it's the Lions or with community health care centers, and if they have access to services, they have teams that run and go their routes. And so at one of my camps, I have people who have care already established. They know that they can't go here, so they come and check in. Okay, was that my working? Cool. And then they go and they have them go to the counseling appointment the next week, and they follow up. We have brought medicine to the camps. When people can't get out to the medicine and have to stand first for first third for appointments. Mm -hmm. Most of my people are disabled or have a developmental disability or have other barriers to health care other than just having insurance. And new patients, when you get out of the hospital, sometimes it's six to eight months, depending on the provider. And so with that, we've got volunteer doctors to come check in on our people. We have other people who have already been tagged by uh, county dollars to be part of the medical response. Mm -hmm. It does. And, I, and my other concern is just when someone gets kicked out of the camp, um, where they go, you said, to, and you don't just push them off. We don't abandon anybody. We try and give the ability to resolve behaviors before they're asked to leave. If you're violent, if you insult my staff, I'm calling the cops. Mm -hmm. If you're yelling at the neighbors, I'm calling the cops. And we cannot gets us to mine down within our internal mechanisms. Mm -hmm. We do not want to be a burden. We want to be a resource to this community. So if someone is behaviorally unsound, we try and get them to mental health. If, we, if someone is out of control, we do what any other resident would do, which is utilize our local systems to support it. Now, if someone would be better suited at one of our other sites, I am not going to have the same come here. This is a cottage grove only site. But I have other sites where I do have beds available. I need to have someone chill for a couple of days. We have other partners who we could potentially navigate for the sake of their ability to come back and be part of their community again. Sometimes we need to check out. Sometimes we need to be right where we are and in there. We can talk people down. These are your people. We want to make sure that they're here first. One more question. How, how do you qualify somebody as a cottage group only and the reason why I ask this is, is I have seen the population growing. And um, just talking with people that come into my business and what they tell me, I shared this story the other night that one of my clients lives on Rao River Road and homeless, unhoused, will walk down her street. And she first thing she said to me is there's a lot of new transients in town. I go, why do you think they're new? What makes you think they're not from here? And she goes, I know because my I have a dog and my other three neighbors all have dogs and our dogs go crazy when they walk in front. Well, all the people that have been here for years, they know to walk across the street. And she goes, my dogs are barking day and night right now. 
And so I'm concerned of how you're going to identify that they are a citizen of Cottage Grove. That's fair. Um, one of the people that I just uh, we recently had to a later rest was born in Cottage Grove. So sometimes their birth certificates are letting us know that they're from here. Other times people have graduated from Cottage Grove. They show us their stuff like, hey, this is where I'm at. We've also had two, uh, two people in this community doing outreach work for the last two years. We have a fair idea about who the current and main population is. People have no clothes, some people are coming out of the woods when it's colder because they need the help. Other people go back and have been back for a while and have been coming out of town for a couple of years. So there's different communities and there's different understandings and there's different needs going on. So we look at what other partners have they been working on? Because we are all tied to the same system. Required these people to receive county and federal dollars to be part of the same network. And so we see where people are going to come from. Also, we work very closely with the community here. We are at the community showers, we have the meetings, we follow up on people. And so the main owner, first, we take in everybody who wants to come from, from the community and said, I'm from here, I'm going to do our thing. And then we know how many beds are actually. And then we go and try and figure out who can we come and who said no first. And we talk to you to see if this is really what they think it is, or we can make it bring in. And so that's our approach. And so there will be people who just moved here. There will be people who just bought a house, cannot make a payment, are now on your streets. Are they technically from here? Well, they bought a house, and now they don't live here. So it's ultimately the onus is good faith by what we're going to do with the data we have. Um, we have the uh, almost by name list that uh, social services do operate here, so we have an approximate number of how many people at a given time are here. It was 196 last time I saw, and so that's up from the 188 last year. So yes, there's a small group there. But where did it come from? Did it come from just got kicked out? Did it come from someone whose person was too loud at night, and so they got kicked out because they didn't care someone from autism? There's different reasons why people on the streets, and we don't know what made them on the streets. We just know. There's people with the yeah, Emma. Um, I again have two questions for you. Um, do you have any programs that focus on getting the, those who are in your population back out into the community? Um, so in terms of work or in, in terms of housing? Uh, in terms of uh, work or experience or not alienating them to their one. Of course. Area. Yes. Um, we want people to be safe as they work out their own trials and tribulations, and then when they're ready to come back to be in the community, if that's their goal, that's where they want to be. We as an organization, we don't want to be around forever. We hope that homelessness and housing come together, and that we are obsolete and we'll write a book. That said, um, we want to make sure that people are ready to integrate when they can. When people are adjusting the meds, when people are getting clean, if that's what they are, or people are just embarrassed that they lost their house because they didn't make their bills, and they're getting back on their feet again. That's for them to do. We want to have opportunities where people on our work teams can go do things around the town, help out community partners, help out community things, do something at the park. We see ways that we can integrate. We see ways that we can uh, work, but we also don't want to supplant anything other people are doing. So we'd like to have invitations to be part of stuff, and we'd like to be able to contribute to our community. Okay. Um, and then my second question is that I believe that with HMIS you have access to data about your um, about people who leave your program and how long they remain housed. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about those numbers? Okay, so I cannot uh, currently talk about like data across a lot of plans, but there are ways to follow up and requirements with a lot of the county contracts and local contracts to follow up on six month and twelve month intervals uh, after someone has been housed or left your shelter. So sometimes it's an update to are they still in house, in which case yet, and then looks up why. And it, it may be because of behaviors, it may be because of income streams, it may be because their need was not currently met. Or the unserved meds, uh, unmet needs in our, our communities are um, disorderly discharged uh, veterans. There's a lot of veteran services, disorderly discharged less than honorable, they don't meet any of those requirements, they don't have any help, even though they're a veteran. So that's an example that we would follow up and we'd still notate the person still in that a category. Mm -hmm. Other times we have people who've been housed through a voucher. If the voucher program continues on and they're able to go, we can verify that they're still in housing and hope with that. I would have to do a report based off of the community at large to see what about growth or they are with their situation. 
but also with our FIFA programs, we have different camps for different reasons. My medical camp is a little bit different than my no barrier and high throat camp. And so people have a higher likelihood to get into other uh, longer term housing from that. Okay, so you don't have a you don't have a data comparison. Right? I'm not I, I'm not at this moment. I can look up that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the okay. question. Councilor Savage. Thank you so much for coming this evening. I know it's not easy to stand here and be asked a bunch of questions, but I really appreciate that you have the knowledge to be able to answer them. Even if you don't have the answers, you're able to say that, and I appreciate that. Um, I basically wanted to commend you for coming down here and being present to answer the questions. I really appreciate all the questions being asked. I think there's not much that I can think of that hasn't already been asked. Um, thank you for coming. Councilor Irvin? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you'd mentioned in part of the process, if someone has to be expelled from the facility, that there was a connection with the Conestoga huts and that made me think of the community supported shelter system up in Eugene, which um, do you know much about them? Is that part of your process to, to pair up with them? Would they be coming down potentially uh, to, to support that? Because we did change a lot of uh, things to, to make way for just that kind of thing uh, on some, you know, nonprofit and, and private uh, properties um, and it, so when you said that it made me think that that's kind of one of the, one of the things that helps soften the landing when someone has to be expelled can you speak to the I guess the value of, of that uh, in concert with what you do thank you and uh, I cannot speak for communities of support shelters I can just say that they are an honored ally in the work against homelessness and that we utilize one of their intellectual properties the Conestoga um, uh, shelter, and so we have four of our own, and they're often used by local communities as their answer, just like pallet structures. And so, I would certainly love to partner more with CSS. We have in the past, um, but I cannot speak to a direct recent uh, re-engagement. They've been working on their camps. We are we share uh, close proximity to two of our camps. And so, but uh, we'd be happy if they have already established uh, something here to follow up and support what they have here. In regards to the safe space or outside of network transfers. We have found that sometimes, well, most times, not every uh, cookie cutter fits for everybody. <laughs> um, the same approach doesn't help if you're in recovery, putting you in an open low barrier camp you know, where there's uh, not uh, um, uh, pro prohibition on drugs uh, would not help someone's recovery. Being able to say, we have the ability to put you here and have you be taken care of in a way that you need. If you need trauma support, if you need drug counseling, whatever the need, we have a safe space for you, whether it's owned by us and somewhere else, or whether it's hosted by somebody else or a different style. Same reason why we might use hourglass in Eugene. Four hours to calm down, talk to a professional, and get aligned with your mental health care. So we have found what we call the chill out thing. We've talked with Square One Villages about it. That's one of the reasons why we made our original prototype for our, our wooden shelter that we, we make ourselves. Uh, with our uh, vocational program. Um, we needed a spot that was safe where someone wouldn't be able to harm themselves as best they could, while still having privacy um, in their unit and be able to be in a close uh, survivable spot to be able to make sure that you're safe and do checkups. And so we now have that in our own uh, catalog and we station those around. We encourage any place that does shelter, any place that does uh, high tension support to have a chill out space, whether it's in the same building or off site. And so that's one of the things we would love to cultivate, whether it's a church and have a conestoga or another unit there to be able to do that. That's ways that we can find ways to help work the community. Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, follow follow up to that uh, is the, the the structures themselves. Um, if there is damage to the structures, is that at the city's expense for repairs? And if you could speak to maybe rates of maintenance costs uh, beyond normal wear and tear in your uh, existing sites? Yes, sir. Um, I think that uh, we, as the vendor, utilize the equipment that you currently have. 
as it is. And so we understand that some of these units have already been used for uh, the warming center, and we are willing to and able to, within a little bit of our budget, uh, replace things like locks or things like that. Um, sometimes, depending on the damage, we have to ensure, as is the city with some of their properties, but I'd really yield to uh, Richard on the liability portions because I haven't seen it. Councilor Soulsby. Um, do you want Richard to answer first? Or, no? Okay. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Um, I, something that's been pretty important to me and that no one can really seem to give me an answer on, and, and um, you were just asked by our youngest member um, what the success rate is for people coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, I, really having a hard time wrapping my heart, head around a low barrier shelter that the <laughs> drug treatment just is not number one priority mm -hmm. or kind of insisted on. And, and so, um, but you don't, I, I would think that that would be part of your proposal mm -hmm. actually is that you would have those numbers to tell us because that speaks mm -hmm. the highest volume of, mm -hmm. of any business that, is conducted is what is what is your success rate? And I appreciate that question and that challenge. Um, different models have different success rates. And so the lowest barriers, and I'm proud of our success rate with our 10 and shelters that we closed in July because of the ending of COVID dollars. We had an 85% success rate for that shelter, but that's where we had dialed supports. That's where we had a hundred thousand dollars case management and other supports. That's where we had community access to professionals who come in and reach people. We'd be bringing in professionals. We had a building that was a lockdown facility. We had county referrals that had all these extra um, supports. And so if we had someone who was not able to work in our network, we had an immediate uh, provider nearby that was transferred over so we can maintain their success. So the availability for vouchers. This is the first year that I have ever seen in my 18 years of all of these things, but we have more vouchers than we have available units in our entire town. There are people fighting over the same things and people with income versus people with a voucher, people with voucher lose everything. And that's already built in some of these big, low barrier, low income uh, shelters and institutions. See, but that, that statement right there is alarming to me, is that you, the, if the population is growing mm -hmm. and you have these great successes mm -hmm. and yet, when the COVID money runs out, you close down. Yep. And yep. so that is scary to me, mm -hmm. investing in something like this. And once our COVID money's gone, how are we going to pay for it? When that is the big part of the RFP that went out is that it's going to be largely up to you guys mm -hmm. to go after that funding. Mm -hmm. And we just closed the camp that had an 85% success rate. So that is a concern. And it's a valid concern. We closed a shelter that was open only under the county's request for a limited term uh, contract. They closed down two hotels, our shelter, and two other shelters for those monies because it was only meant to be during the closures for COVID. And so this is a community shelter. This is a long-term shelter. This is a shelter that's meant to keep people permanently out of homelessness and, and high growth. Y'all are building the houses. You are building the uh, services. You're bringing in the healthcare providers. You guys are already a step ahead of my town. And so I have, I'm down here asking to help y'all because y'all are opening doors for people or other communities have not. And so I believe in the success rate of people who are willing to try. And this is the community that's trying. And so I can't ask my people to try harder. They're already you know, saying that we're going to do this for less than what we charge the other cities to do. Very so we're going to give you the same amount of services that we give everybody else, but we're going to do so because we're committed to making sure the population grows. And so I'm tired of burying people without services. So we wanted to bring services to you. Or the other side of that coin is they're a little bit ahead of us and seeing that it didn't work. So that's that's where I go with that. And so I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I wanted to clarify to you, to me, and to Soulsby here. Um, when you say that, you mean that the grant that you got for mm -hmm. that shelter was a limited grant. Yes. So you were not actively seeking out more 
more for, funding for that grant. Not for that grant because it was going to be transitioned to another site that the county has owned. And so they were not interested in our building anymore. Okay. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I move that the City Council um, award the Highway 99 Emergency Shelter Operations and Services uh, Personnel Services Agreement to carry it forward in the amount not to exceed $200,000 a fiscal year and authorize the City Manager to execute the agreement and all associated documents subject to expiration of the protest period or resolution of any timely filed protest. Got a motion, do I have a second? Second. A motion with a second. Is there more discussion? I have one last thing that I'd like to say. Um, this has been a real touchy thing for a lot of us, this issue of the unhoused and homeless. Um, this, is, this problem is not the council's fault, it's not the city's fault. You, you need to look at the hand of cards that we were dealt basically by the state of Oregon, the county of Lane, as far as I'm concerned, the ninth district court, COVID, and of course the current economy. It's really hard to play any winning hand with those cards. And I feel that this is the best play we can make. Um, you know, we can't leave these people in the park. I don't know if you noticed on the news, but uh, you know, the city of Eugene is going to be paying eight hundred and ten thousand dollars to clean up Washington Jefferson Park. You know, if we leave these people in, in the park for X period of time. I mean, we're, we're, what I'm trying to say is, we're going to be paying for this one way or another, and it's just the way the current country is. We can't bust these people off. And because of some of the things that I've heard and seen on Facebook, it, this is just the reality of the United States of America. What's happening? And I really, I mean, I, I'm a little bit inside, got my heart strings going. I feel the best thing we have going for us at this time is to sign a contract with these folks. So that that's just what I want to say. Councilor Irwin. I want to acknowledge that I see um, really pure intent in, in the execution of what you do. And I appreciate that. I'm not in support of the of the RFP uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with you or what you do uh, for the, the folks that you do. In this case, uh, for me, the ends do not justify the means um, of getting there. Uh, I, I think this is I think this is fraught with more peril than it needs to be. Uh, I think there are other ways to go about it uh, that are slower, um, admittedly, but um, just I want to thank you again for coming. Councilor Solsby. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Chris, I, I wanted to say thank you for coming and presenting this. You did a very good job. Okay, we have a motion with a second. All those in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay item B is inner. Governmental agreement between the city of Cottage Grove and Drain. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. On uh, August 24, 2022, Eric Mongan, the city planner, and myself um, met with Jenny Stevens. She's the Drain City Administrator to discuss the potential of providing planning services to Drain. They currently have a contract with a third party to provide planning services. City Administrator Stevens uh, reviewed the current planning provider service and has decided to look for another provider. She was recommended to contact the City Cottage Grove as we provide other contracted services uh, to other cities, such as our building services to Crestwell, uh, Benita, and Coburg, and we also provide floodplain services to Crestwell. I want to uh, reiterate that this is just planning services, it's not building services. They, re I believe, receive building services from uh, Douglas County. So after reviewing uh, Drain's past workload, types of planning applications, and current development code, the city planner, planning staff believe that they could provide the needed planning services to the city of Drain and not impact Cottage Grove's planning responsibilities. 
and timely response to our city applications. In analyzing it, they believe that it, about five hours per week is um, the amount of service, potentially uh, over a year that would be provided. And the contract that's being proposed is based off that five hours per week and um, an aggregate amount of time between the assistant city planner and the planner, city planner, which came up with uh, $15,000 per year uh, being proposed in the IGA grant. Our, our legal counsel has prepared the IGA the planning services. Um, if the city council approves this this evening, then Drain will be considering it at their October 10th um, meeting. The services that we provide would be compensated on a quarterly payment based in the section three of the IGA. The staff's recommendation is to uh, approve the IGA uh, between the city of Cottage Grove and Drain and direct the city manager to sign the IGA. Any questions? Question, oh, Councilor Salisbury. Thank you. Um, what if it goes over the, the hours estimated? Did we probably already covered that for the yeah, so um, each year, just as we have the same contract in other services, uh, we do an addendum each year. So if we find out that we're providing more services to bring, we would sit down and do an addendum come, um, by the end of June for the next fiscal year, I mean July, so that we would um, we would propose that the rates need to be increased, or in some cases, maybe they would be decreased. Um, you know, drain has... Um, their planning commissions only met once in the last two years. Um, their planning applications, I think they've had one new house in two years. So some of the work that's being proposed in, to, in the beginning is to bring their current de de uh, development code up um, and, and use the model state code. So our staff would work with them to, to kind of bring them into today's world in regards to development and uh, code, and then from there, um, provide their services. Councilor Fleck, I think you raised your hand. I did. Mr. Mayor, I move that the uh, council approve the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Cottage Grove and Drain and direct the city manager to sign the agreement. Second. Got a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just feel it necessary to say I graduated from not Drain High, but <laughs> North Douglas High. Um, yeah, that's what it's, not many of us out there. Um, so what you said, that made me chuckle. Um, I do, and I, I have confidence that you'll be keeping an eye on this, but when I hear that, you know, five hours is not going to impact us at any time, I think of staff um, time and go, well, what are they doing with that time? Um, that there is no impact. Um, of course, I would you know, like to leverage every hour of my employees' time um, for a profit. Um, that being said, I would, I would just I trust that if, if it is take cutting into our primary um, mission here, uh, that, that that will be addressed. Um, so I just wanted to just qualify that. Um, if there's no more discussion, all those in favor of City Father saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Okay. Uh, concerns of Council? Council Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know we're not to comment on the incident on 7th Street, but I was wondering if maybe in future meetings we can discuss uh, police body cams again. I know we did it in the past, and from what I understand, the technology and cost has come down majorly in the last two years. So I'd like to see the, the uh, staff uh, look into that for the future. I think that that protects everybody involved, the city, the citizen, and the police. Um, got a problem we're having with the shopping carts. Well, again, I know we uh, went through all this as a council. Um, I got a nice uh, letter from uh, the folks, the Sowers over at Grocery Outlet. They found a majority of their carts have been missing and we're behind Walmart of all places and a lot of them were so damaged they can't be used. So for a small independent store, not a chain, I feel for these folks because the cost of those carts are well over 300 apiece. They had 11 of them 
that were destroyed. So I'm wondering, um, I know the city's been busy, we've been low on police, lots of stuff going on, but uh, as you know, Tom Monroe used to say, you know, what good is the code book if we don't enforce it? Um, I'd like to see uh, the police out there double checking on it, seeing if people are bringing carts off of the, uh, the, the appropriate properties. Um, that is something that we pass. I'd like to see that, uh, that get go. Um, I want a uh, commendation to Faye Stewart and the work and the people he hired to fix the street over where the trees were. I tell you, the sidewalk that you put, they put in there was it's wonderful. Absolutely great. And uh, the great work over there. Um, and the BMX track, people had a great car wash over at Les Schwab. One of Les Schwab for the water. That was great. Oh, I have another question for Faye. Uh, Benny Hubble Park on the 99 thing, I noticed their paint marks. Is that going to affect the the monolith that's there with the new sidewalk? Is there still room there? Uh, <clears throat> Councilor Roberts, I don't believe so. That it was the utilities were marked because uh, Sudala that is doing the work for the ODOT upgrades is going to install a storm manhole in the center of that intersection and then go uh, towards the river with their detention facility it's not intended to be okay. across there i don't believe it i think it's just the parameters that were uh, laid out when they asked the okay. utilities to come i was just wondering if it was going to be that closer to the road you know but i know they're widening and all that thank you for that answer appreciate that very much uh two more things this friday night my mural committee will be unveiling our second mural on the wall of the book mine during Art Walk at 6.30. Also, some news on the mural committee. We have our own 501c3, um, and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we have uh, four murals scheduled for next year, and uh, funding is pretty much procured for this. I'm really proud of my group, what they've done. And definitely last but not least, uh, BMV had their final awards party and thank you party. And one thing we have forgotten to do as the Bohemia City Marshal, um, we had a, uh, an official Bohemia deputy dog this year. And uh, me and the deputy dog were going around uh, the park and uh, we raised money for the kennel and uh, finally want to get this check to our police department. So I'd like uh, our intern and chief to set forward here is uh, $200 to help uh, keep our kennel going from uh, deputy dog uh, from the boat in you. Yeah, there you go there. That's really good. And I also have in the back of my uh, station wagon about 60 pounds of kibble for you. So, and that's all I have. Once again, thank you very much. Anyone else? Council Savage. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to talk about two different instances that happened over the last week that humanize the folks that we live around. Um, I had the ability to walk into the um, tent city that we have in Trailhead Park the other day. I was looking for a woman who had left some belongings at a location where I was able to gain her belongings. I learned that she was staying back behind um, the old hard knocks and I went looking for her so I could give her her belongings back. And there was a nice young gentleman that I approached and he was so kind and so welcoming, it was very clear that I had no idea what I was doing. And he says, how can I help you? I said, well, I'm looking for a young woman. I need to give her her things back. And he says, you know, I think I know who you're talking about and she's right over here. Um, she was angry and she was yelling. And when I gave her her things back, she cried. Her things, her belongings, when you have so very little to receive them back, it, it made her feel valued in a way that you could immediately see her demeanor change. And although there are issues there, I want to humanize her because she immediately calmed down and was able to have a conversation and when I got back to my car this young man came up to me and he says did you find her okay was that her I said yes it was thank you and he says I'm glad that I was able to help you find her 
I was actually kicked out of this park the other night. So despite his own behaviors, he was also kind and understanding. And I want to humanize him. A few days ago, we had another incident where somebody, and I don't know who this person was, but they were obviously in distress, came walking onto a piece of property that I manage, and the police were called. And they were so kind and compassionate with this young man who was so clearly in distress. The incident was, was quick. It was over and done with before I knew, but the officers were incredibly understanding and compassionate and willing to talk with this young man. And to witness that made me go, it's going to be okay. So I know we have a lot of instances going on here, but let's, let's look at a bigger picture. And when we see good, let's call that out too. So thank you. Councilor Stennett. It was, uh, Mr. Mayor, I was just hoping for a bit of clarification. Yeah, the prepared statement you had read earlier, was that meant to be on, on behalf of the entire council or was that your? That's mine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but with that, if anybody, if this council wants to do one for support of the strike, um, I've been employed out there since February of 89. So this February will be 34 years. I've been working there, paying dues there, and I've been standing on the picket lines there. And I planned on retiring in February, so it might be an early retirement for me, but half that plant site has less than six years seniority. So it's all young people. When I'm standing on the picket line talking to the TV, there's a half a dozen people next to me that are 40 and under. And so, you know, they're my kids' age working out there. They've got a future. I am, I'm not striking for me. I'm striking for them. We're 200 people of 1,100 on strike. This is the whole West Coast. And it is, it is not local. So um, if you know any supervisors out there, don't give them a hard time because they are doing everything they can. They want to go back to work. It's Seattle that's our, our problem. So um, if this council wants to do that, um, I've got a lot of time so we can draft something up and do it as a, as a body. Councilor Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd love to learn more uh, about everything that's going on there, but if it's in keeping, I'd be happy to support. Um, I think I heard a couple of things that um, from in terms of, uh, concerns of council right now that I've been uh, feeling myself and I had written down, um, I processed things maybe a little bit differently. I went to, I would really like a uh, presentation from our police on statistics um, over the last hopefully maybe 10 years was kind of an arbitrary number about the, that would give a picture of what is transpiring here in Cottage Grove. Um, hear a lot about, well, we've always had this kind of problem. Or this has always been this. I'd like to just see um, and have us all be informed uh, together on what what is going on, what violations have been going on, what have been the frequencies, what trends do we see, um, where are violent crimes, where are theft property crimes, um, and have that be somewhat of a regular presentation uh, to us, um, you know, especially in light of everything that's been going on. I get the sense that things are escalating, but I want to check myself and say, is that true? Is it just because I'm seeing more? Am I paying attention more? Um, so uh, that would be my request. My concern is that if there's agreement, it doesn't happen uh, without something formal. Um, so I don't know if it needs to be a motion. Um, so I would entertain, I would say, I would move that the council um, direct city staff, I believe the proper channel is the city manager, uh, to, to present uh, crime statistics uh, in the city of Cottage Grove and surrounding areas of uh, lo local to Cottage Grove uh, for the past 10 years and, and, and do that on a reasonably frequent basis uh, going forward. Second. We have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Uma imagem de que não é qual o assunto do livro, do livro, mas já tem a ideia de água das coisas. Os chefes de Mauro Queijo do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Councilor Roberts, that was on the consent side. So you didn't miss it. It's, it was on the calendar. It was just nice to see each other. Okay, so if there's no more concerns, report from the city manager. You're muted. You're muted still. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one report I do want to tell you is the interim chief, Chief Growth, is working on body cams. He has been investigating um, opportunities there and funding sources and opportunities for us to be able to move forward with that, um, as, as well as a number of other items that um, we can present and provide as we, we talk about the uh, report on what's, what's happening in the police department. Um, we have had two churches uh, volunteer and participate in helping with the shelter site on 99. Um, this weekend, we had one church group who spent probably about four hours in the morning on Saturday making curtains um, and constructing uh, three um, uh, picnic tables that they purchased and donated for the facility there. We have another church that is um, has put about the same amount of money and time involved. They're going to be paying for materials, um, wood and uh, mulch and things to create garden boxes. Um, on the site and so there are plenty of opportunities and we're taking those opportunities and moving forward and giving giving people the opportunity to help. We do know that we are looking for some um, funding and assistance with acquiring some um, washing machine, washer and dryer setup. So we're looking to try to get two stacked units. We have a laundry room on in the building and we have a current old set of washer and dryer but we'd love to try to um, get two sets there and, and it's plumbed and ready for um, two stacks. So that would be something that would be very beneficial to um, the residents there. And so we'll have plenty of those opportunities. Keep an eye on the response network, the responders network that Teresa and Jessica have been um, strong in putting together in the community and, and being a part of. Um, we'll keep posting some things that we need um, at the site and opportunities for people to volunteer and participate there. Um, we've also been in discussion with um, Beds for Freezing Nights. Um, regarding the coordination and how to activate um, beds for freezing nights during the winter as we move into their season in conjunction and coordination with the shelter and um, other opportunities that are there. How, how do we know if there's room there? Can they operate still and do um, their facilities in um, churches? One of the churches has volunteered and said, hey, we're ready and willing to, to have it um, on our facility. And so they're looking to see if they have volunteers and pulling that together as well. Um, I'm slowly getting better here. I think I'll, I'm probably going to be back in tomorrow. We'll see how the test runs tonight. Um, and, but it's an interesting experience to go to a foreign place, not foreign, but another place for a conference and end up, then end up being sick. Um, and not being able to participate in that, um, as much as I wanted to, but, um, it's, um, I'm, I'm getting, getting better and appreciate that. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, city attorney. Oops. Hi, good evening. I'm trying to turn the camera on. There we go. Um, yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to do a really quick reminder. Um, I've advised city staff that uh, sign code regulations that are not content neutral, but are content based, are should not be enforced within your city so acting on my advice um, various portions of the sign code are currently not being enforced those that are content neutral i.e that pertain to size um, placement etc that you don't need to read the sign in order to determine whether they apply continue to be enforced in your city those that require the sign to be read read in order to know whether restrictions apply are not being enforced. That is really the only thing I think appropriate to this <laughs> time, <laughs> this this um, period mm -hmm. of time on your calendar that's relevant to hear from me, but I'm available for any questions. Councilor Irvin? Yeah, I guess I have a, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question. Does that include speed limits? No, speed limits are absolutely being enforced. Um, I, let me be a little more precise. So anything that is a political sign, so you have to read it to know that it is that it um, deals with 
matters that are political that are uh, upcoming on the election. That's why I was talking about the timeliness of my little report, just so folks understand what the city can and can't do as we're in this um, campaign environment. Councilor Solsby. Thank you. So I'm, I'm confused, Carrie. What, what are you saying? So um, signs with, are you, what signs are, are, you're speaking campaign signs and what exactly do you mean? Yeah. So the city has restrictions that apply to political signs. Mm -hmm. And I've advised in order to know whether those restrictions apply, you need to read the signs. So any sign that you have to read that categorizes, um, and there are several examples in your sign code. I've advised staff on what those are. I, I'm not remembering them right off the top of my head, but I um, we've drafted a replacement sign code for the city. And so staff is working on um, bringing that up through the amendment process uh, based on city priorities. But that's, that's the, the, the bottom line. Uh, Councillor Solsby, is that political sign restrictions are not being enforced within the city of Cottage Grove because in order to apply those, you need to read to determine, you need to read the sign to determine whether the restrictions apply. Are you amending the code to make it to where political sign restrictions will be enforced or where they will not be enforced? Well, if uh, you can't use the terminology um, political signs under okay. state and federal constitutional law. So the First Amendment grants a right to free speech and you can restrict content, you can um, impose content neutral regulations. So all sign codes are moving towards that. Um, the League of Oregon Cities has a model sign code that's available online. And if you look at it, you can see that it talks about um, event signs or temporary signs that if you come in and obtain a permit, they can be up for 30 days before and after an event, but they doesn't identify whether that's a real estate, um, you know, property sale or a garage sale or a campaign, if that makes a little bit more sense. Mr. Mongan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, so, what Carrie's referencing in our code, there's a couple of very date specific provisions, such as September, you're not allowed to put up a political sign um, or a, an initiative sign more than, I think it's 60 days before the election. Um, there's also quantity um, provisions in like residential zones and things like that that can be a little bit more problematic because you have to look at the sign to see whether or not it had, you know, you have to read it to then make a determination. So what she's saying is that we can't read the sign. We can enforce things like sign permits. If you're attaching a four by eight sheet of plywood, that's, you know, got political content on it. We could say, get a, a building permit, but we can't look at the content of it or what time of year it's being hung or anything like that. It just has to meet the same criterion as, Victor Rico's or something like that. And so um, Carrie and I have talked about our sign photo for some time and um, Faye and I as well with the plan of uh, asking council to establish a, a committee um, to really understand what the city of Cottage Road wants to have for their sign code um, as a way to make sure that we're capturing, you know, how we support our businesses, but also how we let um, folks speak in our residential neighborhoods as well. Um, for example, in the city of Eugene, um, their regulation is, is compliant, I believe, with state law, um, but it says no more than 36 square feet of signage. Um, it does require that it all be, I believe, one unit, so that wouldn't be the six yard signs totaling that number. Um, so things like that, our code is, either silent or outright in conflict. And so um, as the person who approves those and regulates, um, that's where we're at. We don't, we don't look at the content. Um, if your preferred candidate lost four years ago, we're still not looking at the content. 
And so just to conclude, the point of my report is both to give you um, a little bit of explanation. I know that there's been some questions about why various restrictions haven't been being enforced. So I wanted to explain that, but also to provide a heads up on what you'll be seeing coming down the pike and why, why we'll be doing sign code amendments. Okay. That's all. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So there's no items removed from consent. We're adjourned. <laughs>